This is from GMK Tech, but it's based on an Intel Core Ultra 285H. This is the low power version of the Core Ultra. And the entire reason I'm doing this video is that this surprised me. The performance of the Core Ultra 285H is so close to the Core Ultra 9 285 on the desktop that I really think that even the desktop part may have been meant for mobile first. It's, it's weird, but kind of cool, but also interesting. Oh, and by the way, this has PCIe Gen 4 Oculink so that you can use an, an eGPU at PCIe Gen 4, 4x4 4 4 speeds. So, you know, we're talking like 4060, 4070, 5060, 5060 Ti you could use as an external GPU without bottlenecking it too bad, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a look at, this is the GMK Tech Evo T1. 64 gigabytes of memory in this thing, DDR5. And uh, it's a surprisingly expandable platform, but let's, let's, let's unbox, let's dive in, let's take a look. So the rear I.O. here is nothing really super remarkable. We've got USB 4, HDMI, full-size DisplayPort, Oculink, which remember, Oculink is not a hot plug. It's not plug and play. You have to turn the machine off and on to plug it in. If you hot plug Oculink, you're liable to kill the port. Don't do it. You get two USB 2 ports, and then we got two LAN interfaces. Now this works in a tower or desktop configuration but you know, there you go. At the front, we've got three super speed type A, a type C port that is not USB 4, combo headphone microphone port. There's also another combo headphone microphone port at the back and then it's got its DC power brick input. Its power brick is this tiny hockey puck and it is 19 volts, 148 watts. In the box, you get an HDMI cord as well as a Visa mounting bracket and the appropriate mounting screws. So you can mount this behind a monitor, build your own AIO, which actually is a pretty good strategy. Like if, you, if an AIO is attractive to you and it's like, I just want to mount this to a monitor, you can. And that style Visa bracket is the kind where you could mix it with a mount. So depending on your monitor, it's just a thin piece of metal and it's an offset mount for this. So it'll screw into these holes at the bottom here and it can hold the PC offset versus like a, an actual Visa mounting situation. A lot of displays that come with their own foot use a different mounting mechanism for their foot and then just have Visa holes. This will go into that, no problem. But it's nice that the mounting mechanism that they have assumes that it's not gonna take over the Visa mounting if you case, you know, like you have your monitor set up to mount to a wall or a, a post or an arm or something. Uh, this can coexist with the arm, potentially. The larger fans tend to mean that it's quieter, which is nice. There's a fan on the top and bottom. The top fan cools the CPU, the bottom fan cools the rest of the system. Memory, M.2. A DDR5 memory can run a little toasty. Internally, we have three M.2, one of which is occupied by our Crucial PCIe 4 one terabyte drive. And then just underneath that, we have our Wi-Fi solution. There's an antenna located just above the wired network port at the back and one at the front, which should clear our metal holding cradle. Internally, we've got two ADATA 32 gig DDR5 5600 DIMMs, and that's about it for the user serviceable components. I can see that they have a copper heat sink. It looks like a copper vapor chamber heat sink. I'm, uh, don't quote me on that. It's a thick piece of copper connected to some uh, heat spreading fins at the rear, which makes sense that Core Ultra 285H does have some quite some hot spots. There's no biometrics or fingerprint sensor or anything like that, which is probably good. You know, save a few bucks on the on the construction of this. Now, one curious thing about the two fan design is that on the bottom, they have holes and the holes are good for the CPU intake. On the top with the larger fan, it's a lower RPM, but it depends on pulling air in from a very small gap that's maybe three or four millimeters. So it's gonna pull air in from the sides here. Try to make sure that that's dusted because if that's obstructed, your memory will overheat and throttle. Seems like the hardest thing to do to run on this is uh, AI in terms of noise levels. So running AI jobs makes it louder even than playing games or anything else. In normal operation, even at full load. Remember, you've got six performance cores, eight efficiency cores, and two low power efficiency cores. So it's six plus 10 total. And you know, if you're running at full tilt, can it keep it cool? Yes, it, it can. Surprisingly well, in fact. The sort of the top end noise level that I can get from this is about 38, 39 dB. Um, running AI workloads, it, 
the fan will ramp between 30 and 35. They could maybe work on the fan curves just a little bit in the AI workload uh, scenario, but if you're playing games, even like Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 30 FPS, it's a pretty consistent like 32 dB. So very, very quiet in other words. They've done a nice job with the thermals and acoustics on this in my opinion. For AI testing, I like to use Intel's AI Playground along with some other stuff that we'll talk about in a second. AI Playground is highly optimized for the Intel platform. Basically, in, in, the Intel team and the, the folks Intel are paying to work on that have pulled out all the stops and they pre-select some models and they try to make it really easy for you to get started with image generation and text and even um, something called a retrieval augmented generation RAG, which means that you can give it a document and request that it do things. Now, the models here are pretty small. They're, they're on the order of seven to 12 billion parameters. GMK Tech says that, hey, with this 64 gigabyte of RAM platform, you can run, you know, a 60 billion parameter model. That's a Q4, so it's gonna use about 32 gigs of VRAM. And if we check in Device Manager, we can see that Intel has also updated their drivers to better handle shared memory, meaning that this thing is really not reserving very much memory at all. In Task Manager under memory, I can see 64 gigabytes, but on the GPU section, I can see that the GPU has access to 32 of those 64 gigabytes. This is great because, you know, just a few months ago and last year, you would have to reserve an enormous amount of memory for your GPU in order to be able to run these larger models. Models, even for LM Studio. So like LM Studio, everybody wants to run LM Studio. Intel here, it's not really that they're at a bit of a disadvantage, but like where they're relying on OpenVINO on the AI Playground side, in LM Studio, they're relying more on Vulkan, the Vulkan backend, right? Same as, you know, the gaming side of things. And you lose a little bit of performance and overhead with that. Nevertheless, it gives you access to a lot more models and a lot more uh, optimized models and you don't ha necessarily have to worry about the different number formats and things like that, that that AI Playground kind of papers over for you in terms of, you know, you know just because you can run Granite or you can run GPT OSS doesn't mean you can run GPT OSS in a, the particular format. You know, it's like, is it Q4? Is it FP4? Is it INT4? Is it this special version that's actually like five bits for floating point, block floating? There's a whole, there's a whole rabbit hole you can go down. LM Studio does work on this platform and it does work reasonably well. It mostly works with the GPU on Vulkan, so you're not able to take as much advantage of the NPU. You can do processing on CPU. You can mix CPU and GPU processing. This platform, because it is fundamentally just DDR5, understand that you're limited by that 75 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. These, these AI models are all about how much memory bandwidth they have. And so this, 75 gigabytes, you know, as compared with the GPU that say might have 500 gigabytes of, of memory bandwidth and on up, um, you're okay running, you know, 14 and, and 20 billion parameter models. Uh, GPT OSS 20B, which is a, about a 12 gigabyte model, it'll use 12 to 15 gigabytes of VRAM, plus another few gigabytes of context for the, you know, the context of the query, the thing that you're asking, that will run okay-ish on this platform. One of the things I like to always ask the LLM to know how intelligent they are is to write a program to search for perfect numbers because you can get an, like a correct answer could be seven lines of Python, but you can go much, much deeper on that particular math problem to the nth degree. You could probably do an hour long video about it. I understand that also in the AI world, there's a bit of an arms race right now to come up with the most intelligent and smallest model to be able to unlock things on this kind of hardware. I mean, sure, there's a lot of amazing things going on in Mount Olympus with the multi-million dollar single, like just one rack. You have to have thousands of racks. And just like one rack is multiple millions of dollars. There's lots of amazing things going on there. But depending on what they figure out at Mount Olympus, they'll be able to reach down and offer us new algorithms and new fun things that'll run on, you know, the relatively pleb to your hardware for AI, and it'll be fun and interesting. Now the BIOS tour of this was really interesting. First of all, GMK Tech doesn't lock anything out. The platform is fully open. Keep in mind this platform is also meant for mobile, so there's a lot of stuff in there that's applicable only to mobile. Like the processor can downclock when the laptop's getting hot. It doesn't need to do that because it's a desktop. There's a lot of other stuff in there too, like Intel Active Management Technology, AMT. This is not vPro, you can't get vPro functionality, but they left the BIOS options for that in, so you could maybe get that working for remote management. CEC support, that's one that you might wanna to toggle on. If you toggle that on, then this device can wake up an HDMI display automatically. That's pretty cool. There's a lot of other fun options in there. You can also turn on Intel VMD, VROC, 
<laughs> rest in peace V-Rock team, I'm so sorry. It's set up for, you know, NVMe RAID 1 or RAID 0 boot drive mirroring. That actually is another feature in favor of, uh, you know, developer workstation, because developer workstation RAID 1 boot drive, I think makes a lot of sense, especially when you got a fleet of these. Network stack settings also enables it to boot from the network, even though it's a Realtek based uh, NIC. I'm slightly surprised they didn't opt for the Intel 226V, but eh, it's fine. Overall, A plus to GMK Tech for leaving the BIOS at this level of unlocked. All right, so what's the bottom line? It's gonna come down to the cost value proposition. It's a Core Ultra 285, it's H, low power, but still within striking distance of the Core Ultra 9 285 on desktop, yeah, I really think that, like, if you really look at it and you look at, like, the actual experience, you get six performance cores instead of eight, that's really the performance fall off. The single core performance here is very similar to desktop, which also tells you that, you know, the desktop processor doesn't really have a ton of overclocking headroom. Even despite our maximum boost clock here being 5.4 gigahertz, the real world feel and some of the numbers in the benchmark sort of belie that it's only 5.4 gigahertz. It's faster than I expected. The AI performance is reasonable and everything else is reasonable. The build itself is reasonable and Oculent gives you a decent expansion option. So if you need a small form factor mini, mini PC or something with reasonable, like reasonable high end performance you can mount behind a display, this thing is pretty good. It runs Linux pretty well. Look for some more coverage on the Linux channel. It's 64 gigs of memory, it's expandable. Has it like a developer workstation with six performance cores and then 10 efficiency cores? It's not bad. Having multiple M.2 for expansion and storage and that kind of thing, again, not bad. You could add more storage to it and run whatever you want. Uh, casual gaming is a bit of a pass. So like, it's like, oh, I wanna occasionally play a game on my small form factor machine. Uh, not gonna happen unless you connect a GPU with USB 4 or uh, Oculink, which by the way, the clickbait insanity that I love to do is, uh, let's connect an $8,500 GPU via USB 4 and see if we can run AI on it. That works fine with the USB 4 uh, connection on the, the one that it has. You can also run something like this with Oculink and it would be more than twice as fast. And you should definitely do that with an Oculink enclosure instead of USB 4. The Oculink also works well on this platform, but I was sort of delighted to see that a 96 gigabyte VRAM GPU will run pretty okay from that USB 4 connection. So let's dive into the benchmarks and talk particulars. A to 64 is looking about like we'd expect, 75 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. The latency is a little, you know, 130 nanoseconds. I feel like they could probably do some tuning and get this to be a little bit better, but it is DDR5 5600 with 46, 45, 45 CR2 timing. So maybe not entirely unexpected. Now I happen to get in several 285 based mini PCs at the same time and uh, they have a little different configuration internally, but you know, running the Blender benchmarks or GMK Tech, they're all pretty much within margin of error. The B-Link is at a slightly lower power target, but it's quieter. You'll have to check out the review for that if you're interested. Junk Shop, it's the same story. It's pretty much identical performance across all three platforms. Uh, and Monster is 117 FPS on our GMK Tech Evo Ti AI. GMK Tech has also put a little bit more time into tuning the built-in GPU, 234 FPS in the Classroom GPU benchmark, 230 FPS in the case of Junk Shop, uh, and 386 FPS in Monster. Cinebench R23 Multicore, 18796, a very respectable score. Your single core speed, 2173. You can really see those 5.1 gigahertz boosts. Same pattern pretty much holds up in Cinebench 24. The GMK Tech pulling slightly, slightly ahead, but again, these, these are essentially all the same scores. Single core speed, the Minis Forum pulls ahead a little bit with 132, but 128 and 127 for our GMK Tech Evo. Everything aligns with expectations. CPU-Z multi-score 8643 and our single core speed 842. How does our ARC 140T GPU do in this scenario? Not too bad, 5602 in our uh, Puget Bench and After Effects. Photoshop is 7987 and Premiere Pro is about 30,047. The scores here on these are pretty similar with the exception of the Photoshop score. I'm not sure why the Minis Forum pulls so far ahead of the other two because in the gaming benchmarks, it shows the GMK Tech had actually put a little bit more tuning into power budget for the GPU as opposed to the CPU. And so the gaming performance was a little different on the GMK Tech. I'm not sure what to make of that. 
if you're thinking the ARC 140T would be good enough for gaming, not at 1080p. Uh, 1080p, you're, you're looking at like 35 to 36 FPS with 18 FPS for your 1% lows. If you do scaling, like 720p scaling, and you're doing you know older titles or uh, esports titles, it can be okay. But mostly, this is not a platform for gaming. Uh, with possible, you can get away with esports gaming. Even playing Stellaris on this, not terribly satisfying. So that's pretty much it. It really does come down to price, price performance, like what you're looking for. You, depending on what you're doing, you may end up paying a little bit of a premium for the small form factor design. But depending on what you're doing, depending on the bills and where you are and what sort of global macroeconomic situations you're facing, uh, it, it might not make sense for you to go with such a small form factor machine. You may want to build something, but this little thing, it's got the performance and I was surprised. Uh, if you want me to try a workload or have questions or whatever, hit me up in the forum. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.